And joining us now on the line from San Francisco, California, Zach Lynch, the author of The Neuro Revolution, How Brain Science is Changing Our World. Zach, it's good to have you on TVO tonight. How are you? Doing well. Thank you very much. Glad to hear it. I want to start by asking you about the economy, since that's front and center on so many people's minds these days. You write that neuroscience has the potential to eliminate these kind of insane bust and bubble cycles that we seem to be in every decade or so. How will improved understanding of the brain help us get to there? Well, one of the first industries that will adopt neurotechnology is the finance industry. And this is exactly what we would expect if we uh, look at history. At the spark of the Industrial Revolution, it was the banks in England that took advantage of the recently developed water mechanization technology to improve uh, the efficiency of transporting gold ingots. Um, it was the banks who first used electricity and the telegraph systems uh, to expand their networks internationally. And it was with the development of the microprocessor and computer networks that allowed banks to ultimately develop real-time global financial networks. So from the perspective of leveraging uh, neuroscience to better understand how we make more, m might make more intelligent economic decisions, uh, we turn to a recently developed uh, discipline over the past 10 years called neuroeconomics. And neuroeconomics is really focused on understanding the neurobiology of decision making. And it turns out that neuroeconomics tells us from the most recent research that we're really not the rational economic actors that conventional economic theory would have us uh, make, out, make us out to be. One of the most interesting questions that neuroeconomists are asking is what makes us happy? And it really turns out that we're not very good at understanding what uh, types of decisions will uh, make us happy even when we think we know what will make us happy like an event uh, such as a purchase or perhaps um, moving to a new city for a new job we generally do a poor job and generally overestimate the amount of happiness that a particular decision will uh, make or give us so for example let's say we'd like to buy a new BMW and we think it'll make our life much better. Well, the truth of the matter is that when we look at it uh, in the studies, it turns out that it will excite us for much less longer than we had anticipated, and it will excite us for much less um, amount of time. So most recently, um, a lot of this neuroeconomic research has been um, aggregated together and uh, into a new field called neurofinance. At least that's what it's been dubbed. Now, looking forward, we can see that neurotechnology-enabled traders will have several new tools um, at their disposal to be able to improve trading performance on real-time global financial networks. Zach, let me jump One in with a follow-up here for a second, because sure. I want to read a quote from your book. Here's the quote. It says, whenever we believe that we're rational about financial choices, we're gripped by a dangerously irrational belief. Emotions constantly distort our attempts to be smart with money, but those same emotions, if understood and harnessed, can revamp our style and help us make far more profitable choices. So follow up, explain that, how understanding all of what you're talking about here can make us make more rational choices when it comes to money. Well, it's all about developing tools and training methods to help us understand how the actual neurobiology of economic decisions are made on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And uh, one of the types of tools that will emerge in the coming years are neurosoftware applications that are based upon uh, neuroeconomics research that help individuals understand when they are making decisions that, uh, where they are overestimating the value of what they think um, that particular decision will bring them. Another set of technologies that will emerge will be uh, real-time neurofeedback and brain scanning systems that will correlate previous trades with your continually shifting neurobiology to optimize the profitability of decisions that you might make in uh, the financial arena. Let me follow up now, on that one with, with uh, sure. brain imaging technology because you say that's about to explode as we go forward into the future. And you've quoted in your book a marketing executive who says, instead of hypotheses 
about what people think and feel, you will actually, because of these brain scans and brain imaging technology, you'll actually see what they think and feel. And I wonder if you could help us understand how that might affect marketing and advertising and good old-fashioned consumption going forward. Right. Well, there's a new emerging discipline, another one, called neuromarketing. And neuromarketing uses brain imaging technologies in conjunction with traditional advertising technologies such as eye tracking software, um, galvanic spin, skin response technologies, in order to improve advertising effectiveness. Uh, there are currently uh, eight or nine neuromarketing firms worldwide that I know of that I'm currently tracking. And they are using these technologies to improve advertising effectiveness. So for example, uh, there is a firm in Boston, Arnold Worldwide, that is working with one of their clients who uh, currently makes Jack Daniels, the Tennessee bourbon. And they used neuromarketing to improve the choice of commercials that they had decided to use um, in their fall campaign. And how they went about this was they brought a group of students together and they asked them whether or not they liked particular scenes um, that were attractive or not attractive. And in some of these scenes, there were pictures of woodsy, outdoor, rugged landscapes. In other scenes, there were uh, scenes of individuals frolicking on the beaches um, during spring break. Now, these people knew that they were working uh, on a project with Jack Daniels. And so the subjects responded to or said they responded um, most uh, emphatically to the backwoods, rugged, outdoor scenes. That's got to be the case, Zach, the because there's just no way if you drink Jack Daniels, you're a frolicker. You're just not. <laughs> well, it turns out yeah. that if you looked at the brain imaging uh, responses and information, that the, the brain uh, activation uh, occurred much stronger and for a much longer period of time in the areas associated with short-term and long-term memory on the images and scenes of people drinking Jack Daniels on the beach. So they used that additional information from brain imaging to help them make more intelligent decisions. You know, I'm just so glad Mr. Sinatra is not alive to hear you say that because that was his favorite drink and I just don't think that he could he could take hearing that conclusion. But anyway, let me move on to law and order. Uh, how about policing? You see a future, you tell us, when the brains of suspected criminals could be scanned for evidence. How might that work? Well, one of the areas where neuroscience is already having an impact is on the legal system. Uh, currently in the United States, there are over 1,000 cases where neuroscience is at sort of the core of the argument. And at the core of many of these questions, uh, cases is when should we accept um, the defense of my brain made me do it as a valid defense? In other words, should people with diminished uh, capacity uh, from either addiction or a mental illness or a traumatic brain injury uh, be given more lenient sentences? We already accept the fact in the United States that minors can't be uh, convicted of uh, capital punishment and, uh, and that is based on findings from neuroscience that shows um, that the brains of minors uh, aren't fully developed mm -hmm. uh, cognitively. So looking forward to get to your question, one of the most important neurotechnologies that will dramatically impact uh, the court systems in the coming years is truth detection technology. There are currently several companies who are developing these technologies. One is called brain fingerprinting technology. The other uses functional magnetic resonance imaging technologies in order to detect the truth. Um, now, if you ask any rational neuroscientist today, uh, most would agree that these technologies are not ready for prime time, and I would agree. But that didn't stop a judge in India uh, late last year from actually using these technologies in, uh, and information from a brain scan to convict a woman of a crime. So it's important to note that looking forward, truth detection technologies, all types of neurotechnologies, will impact each nation and society differently. And just tell and me as a follow-up, do you think that lying in the future will be impossible to get away with? I think it'll be more difficult because hmm. we will have additional information. So how this will play out globally is in open democratic societies, uh, these technologies will be used to protect and free the innocent. Whereas in uh, closed autocratic regimes, 
Uh, they will use them to silence dissent and enforce loyalty. Hmm. So looking forward, uh, one thing is for sure, as truth detection technology is developed, brain privacy will become um, a critical civil rights issue uh, in the 21st century. That is, the right of an individual to protect their thoughts from unwanted intrusion, be it from a government or a business. Hmm. The vision you are offering us of the future is one where I guess everything is going to be very much more transparent. Transparent to the police, transparent to marketers, and yet you tell us that the highlight of our neuro society will be the tools that will help make living in our highly connected urbanized world not only tolerable, but also, you say, possibly magnificent. And my question is, magnificent? How? Well, there are so many ways that uh, technology over human history has improved the, our standard of living. And it's very difficult to predict the future. But what we can see is that if we look at history and look at the ways that the agricultural revolution and the industrial rev revolution and the current information revolution um, has transformed our world and made it better for billions of us to live um, longer lives and more effective lives, um, when we look at the coming neuro revolution over the next 50 years, it becomes apparent that these technologies will be used for both good and bad purposes, but that, the, that we should be looking forward to whole new forms of art um, and entertainment. We should be looking forward to uh, new ways to improve our judicial systems. Um, so there are many aspects of our coming neuro society that we should look <coughs> forward to in a positive fashion. Brain research, you tell us just finally, will make it possible for us to live in a much more trusting culture and not only because we're not going to be able to get away with lying as much as we do today, but also because we are going to better understand how the hormone oxytocin can affect us. Explain that just finally before we join the others on the other side of the studio. Sure. The uh, neuroeconomist Paul Zak at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California has spent his career over the past 10 years researching oxytocin and its role in, in trust as well as trustworthiness. And it turns out that this small neurohormone plays a critical role in human bonding. So if there are ways that we can create new legislation or design our society or our institutions or the practices and policies that we use to define our daily existence to improve trust, perhaps even the architecture or color of the rooms um, that our students work in on a daily basis. Um, the more that we can learn about how we might be able to pump up, if you will, naturally, this naturally occurring neurohormone, oxytocin, perhaps the more trusting um, a society we may have. Hmm. Zag, we're going to continue our discussion about neuroenhancing drugs uh, with uh, four other guests on the other side of the studio. So stand by, and I'll be back at you in just a minute or so, okay? Great. Very good.